Hello. So when I started researching this talk, I thought, oh, I'll have a look for images of disruption and disruptive design. And I found this bleak picture. I found this in an image search. And as scary and as bleak as it looks to most of us, I actually think that this is really an approach that a lot of people are taking to technology today. It's deliberately invoking the Latin phrase, aut neca, aut necare. I'm not very good at pronouncing Latin. Either kill or be killed. It is a common attitude in technology and in business today. In tech today, disruption usually means destruction. Like if we think about organizations like Airbnb, it's disruptive and great for some, but for others, renting accommodation has become unaffordable in the cities they live. Uber discourages people from taking public transportation. It's putting more cars on the road when we're facing a global environmental catastrophe. We should take care of the words that we use and examine them and the goals that they represent and the effects that they have on the work that we do. It's too easy to dress up what we're doing in jargon and in euphemisms, and it makes us get away with things we shouldn't necessarily get away with. Engagement. I mean, you can't read a piece on Medium without tripping over this word. But what does it actually mean? Like, what are we trying to achieve with engagement? Views, clicks, interactions, prolonged usage? Really, engagement that doesn't serve a user's agenda is addiction. Their addiction makes us money. And you think this sounds like exaggeration, but remember, we're working in an industry where this book exists and was voted one of the best business books of the year by Goodreads readers. They say that admitting you have a problem is the first step to recovery. Dear tech industry, we have problems, lots of them. So today I've not got much time, so I'm very briefly going to go through a few patterns that I think are representative of the problems that we have in this industry. The kinds of patterns, like those words that we use so frequently, without stopping to consider why. So, as the author of a book on accessibility, I thought I'd better start with accessibility. So in case you don't actually know what I mean by accessibility, accessibility is the degree to which technology is usable by as many people as possible especially disabled people, because we're very good at excluding disabled people with technology. So pattern number one, low contrast text, is text whose color is low contrast against the background color, much like this slide. That's much better. A few months ago, WebAIM, an accessibility organization, analyzed the top one million websites for accessibility. Of all the issues they found on the, these one million sites, low contrast text was the most prevalent. And it has a surprisingly large impact. It affects people with eyesight loss and impaired vision, colorblind people, people using screens with low resolution, people using devices in bright lights and spaces. Most often we find low contrast text in places like this, in footers, secondary text, legal text. This is the footer of the Apple website. Because as designers, it's very common for us to lighten text as a way of sort of sorting out our information hierarchy. We consider it less important, we'll make it a lower contrast to help people focus on the text we think is important. But if it's so low contrast that it's hard for people to read, your decision about what content is important has an even greater impact. So this is the LinkedIn learning site, very low contrast text in that big dialog box there. I'm cynical. Not that cynical that this is intentional, but still, if you read this text, what's being dismissed away here? These cookies enable us and third parties to track your internet navigation behavior on our website and potentially off our website. What does that mean, in the real world? We have to question these decisions, these design decisions and the agenda behind them. So I'm gonna sum each of these patterns up and here, low contrast text, it's popular pretty bad for inclusivity and accessibility. It's not usually done maliciously. And lucky for us all, easy to fix. 
We can still use contrast and color to distinguish the hierarchy. We just need to do so within a spectrum of readable text. So this is a great article by Stephanie Walter about how to do so. And this book by Jerry Cody is fantastic for learning workflows that you can incorporate into your work. I will link, have links in my slides after the talk so you don't have to worry about recording these now. <laughs> so I'm rating all of these patterns. And the overall rating I've decided to give low contrast text is a sad, pensive face. So it's good at this point to maybe note the difference between inclusivity and accessibility, just in case you're not really aware of it. So accessibility could be described as you have a shop. It's a little bit raised from the ground. It's raised from the road. So you decide to put step in. But then you realize that people using wheelchairs or parents pushing prams or people using walkers can't access it through the steps. So you stick a ramp on the side. It's a bit ugly. It's bolted on. It's an afterthought. People end up in the back of the shop. But it's there. You've provided accessibility. Inclusive design is if you added both a ramp and stairs at the very beginning so that people had equal access to the front of your shop. And of course, you'd have rails for support and edges so that people don't fall off the ramp or the steps, and markings so people can distinguish the steps so that they can easily climb them. I'm not going to win any awards for shop design, but I hope you get my point. And of course, inclusion is not exclusive to disabled people and people with impairments. When we talk about inclusivity in technology, we're usually talking about how to better include people from a variety of marginalized backgrounds. Those are not the users we usually center in our design. Which means you can have accessibility without inclusivity, but it's short term and it's kind of superficial. We need inclusivity to make better technology. Because most of the people who are the leaders of today's technology create it to suit their own needs. And if they look like this, and they're mostly white, usually men, relatively wealthy, heterosexual, cisgendered, college educated, English speaking, and able bodied, that's how we're going to make technology. So, on to our next pattern capture. Because it happens on a lot of sites. We don't necessarily intend it from the beginning. It's a challenge response test used in computing to determine whether or not the user is human. It's an acronym for completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. It's used generally to prevent bots from accessing a site so they can't index it, um, but also to stop people and bots from accessing features repeatedly for free. We used to have other types of capture, but nowadays this is most likely what you'll see. You're asked to identify pedestrian crossings and traffic lights and other geographic features that can assist with mapping. Detecting whether you're human is actually more about the time delay and the movement in your interactions. I mean, often at this point, it's already detected whether it thinks you're human or not. According to similar tech, 4.25% of sites use capture. And this is a big problem because capture is a major issue for people who use screen readers. And we saw an example of how screen readers work in Paul's talk. In 2017, WebAIM's survey of screen reader users reported capture as significantly the most problematic feature when trying to access the web. Because capture dictates that proving you're not a robot requires significant and specific visual, spatial, linguistic, and mathematical skill. And people with assistive technologies like screen readers often report they get classified as a bot and are denied access. And we understand why people might choose to implement capture on their own sites, but why is it so prevalent? Over 2 million sites use capture, recapture specifically, Google's free capture service. What's in it for Google offering this service for free? Why do they tell us we need it for everything? Right now, we're helping Google digitize books, recognize images, stop self-driving cars from running through traffic lights. A woman in the US a few years ago even sued Google, saying by filling out these captures, she was doing, giving free labor to them. But capture is evolving. Specifically, Google's capture is evolving. They've introduced recapture three, which returns a score for each request without user friction. What is user friction? It's people knowing it's even there. 
it operates invisibly on the site. So is that better for accessibility? Well, only if it's not classifying people using assistive technology as bots anymore. But recapture works best when it has the most context about interactions with your site, which comes from seeing both legitimate and abusive behavior. For this reason, we recommend including recapture verification on forms or actions, as well as in the background of pages for analytics. To work, recapture needs to be deeply embedded within your site with access to all of the interaction conducted on the site. If you think Google having unprecedented ac access to our interactions is no problem, I have some reading material for you. The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. It's a big book, but it's a good book. So what is surveillance capitalism? It unilaterally claims human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. Although some of these data are applied to product or service improvement, the rest are fabricated into prediction products that anticipate what you will do now, soon, and later. Basically, surveillance capitalism is when a platform surveils our behavior and monetizes it. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's not unique to Google. Pretty much every big tech company is doing that as their primary business model today. In fact, of Google, Shoshana Zuboff says, Google's proprietary methods enable it to surveil, capture, expand, construct, and claim behavioral surplus, including data that users intentionally choose not to share. And so at this point, you're probably thinking, oh, Laura, why are you talking about this? There's people starting to throw things at me from the back. These are not topics that are easy to talk about. They're not easy to talk about with our coworkers. They're not easy to talk about with our bosses or our clients. And that is why I am here, <laughs> to try and help you do that. So capture, it's popular, poor for inclusivity and accessibility, and the ethics are misjudged. As we get into features that are entangled with our business models and business goals, fixability becomes far trickier. If we're genuinely trying to prove a person is human, privacy respecting alternatives do exist, they're in the works. But we have to be willing to try and find these alternatives and not just use what everybody else is using because some good PR campaign told us to. So Capture's overall rating is a worried face from me. The next pattern, it's not getting any more fun, profiling. <laughs> Profiling is the process of construction and application of user profiles generated by computerized data analysis. Sounds familiar from some of the talks today. Profiling props up the majority of today's big tech. All of these sites use the profiles they've gathered to target users with advertising and content to maximize their profits. At this point, I want to remind all of you that you are not just people who work with technology, you are users too. And so as customers or consumers, you might say, well, I like relevant advertising. I hear this so often. I heard this last night. I don't want to see ads for irrelevant junk I don't like, but are all the ads actually really relevant to you? So this is my Facebook profile. I barely use it. I'm still on there, but I barely use it. Don't really fill it out very much. Don't like or share anything. So I get ads aimed at a stereotypical woman in her early 30s. And this is why Facebook.com will only let you sign up as male or female. No non-binary options, no self-declared gender options that you get after you signed up, because it makes it easier to put you in that box right away. As Eva Bloom de Monte wrote in The New Statesman, when profiling us, companies are not interested in our names or who we really are. They're interested in patterns of our behavior so that they believe match an audience type. So to target us more efficiently, the advertisement industry relies on a very binary vision of the world. And through this, advertising continues to perpetuate stereotypes and existing prejudices. We need to be clear that a data-driven world where artificial intelligence makes decisions based on simplistic profiles of us isn't going to solve prejudices it's going to perpetuate them. And this isn't just about ads that tell women they should be focused on domestic tasks and looking pretty and getting pregnant. Advertising continues to perpetuate stereotypes and existing 
prejudices. So in 2016, ProPublica discovered about Facebook, the ubiquitous social network not only allows advertisers to target users by their interests or background, it also gives advertisers the ability to exclude specific groups it calls ethnic affinities. And even when Facebook removed this, bear in mind they said they had no liability, so you couldn't target those groups with those specific types of ads, it still perpetuates inequality through its algorithms. A study into Facebook picked to show ads to sort of broad groups showed given a, oh, that great? given a large group of people who might be eligible to see an advertisement, Facebook will pick among them based on its own profit maximizing calculations, sometimes serving ads to audiences that are skewed heavily by race and gender. And you start thinking, well, how much does that really affect me? But in these experiments, Facebook delivered ads for jobs in the lumber industry to an audience that was approximately 70% white and 90% men, and supermarket cashier positions to an audience that was approximately 85% women. Home sale ads were meanwhile delivered to approximately 75% white users, while ads for rentals were shown to a more racially balanced group. They concluded that an ad system that is designed to maximize clicks and to maximize profits for Facebook will naturally reinforce these social inequities and so serve as a barrier to equal opportunity. So we have to ask, when maximizing clicks to maximize profit reinforces social inequities, what does that mean for tech's dominant funding models? What are we doing? And web-based tracking is just the beginning. We have things that look inside your home. We have things that your kids can talk to and what they're saying privately gets sent to a big multinational corporation. Put a chip in your baby with a smart pacifier. Loon cup, smart menstrual cup. Smart dildo. This smart dildo specifically was sued for tracking their users' habits. <laughs> Many companies get away with this kind of tracking because they will just hide it away in the terms and conditions. And have you ever wondered how many calories you're burning during intercourse? How many thrusts? The speed of your thrusts? The duration of your sessions and the frequency? How many different positions you use in the period of a week, a month, or a year? Well, you want the eye condom. <laughs> and it exists. And do you want to share all of that information with advertisers, insurers, your government, and who knows else? I'm not saying that you shouldn't want to use any of these products as a concept. They could be quite cool. But the cost of using those products should not be our personal data, our privacy, our power, control, or agency. Because privacy is not about hiding. It's about having power and agency over how your information is used. And this is an inclusivity issue. We have to pay greater attention to who benefits and who loses out when targeting is involved. One person's relevant advertising is another person's grounds for discrimination. And again, this is an exaggeration. Look at this, this is a report into what data brokers can obtain. See under health interests, they're looking at whether you're disabled. Potential employers could use this information to exclude people with disabilities from targeted job ads. Next time we say that privacy is a low cost for convenience, we must remember the people whose data is used against them and that it could be us. So profiling is immensely popular, massively and negatively impacts inclusivity and accessibility. And the ethics are something we do need to be concerned about. And here's the kicker. Unlike some other patterns, it's not easy to fix. Big tech will not be reformed, because it doesn't want to be reformed. It sees no problem with what it's doing wrong. It just thinks it has a public relations problem. These guys, six of the 12 richest people in the world. Their platforms are bigger than countries. They have more lobbying power and influence than anybody else in the world. They do not have a problem. This means we can't reform the massive corporations that we're working for from the inside. People may have less will in the world to actually do so, but we have to find our power elsewhere. 
This is what happens to people who try to change big tech from the inside. They can't be fired, so they get demoted and lose the responsibility and lose the power they already had. We need new models, not just new role models, but new funding models, new ways to fund technology where access to technology and civil rights are not pitted against each other. As designers, we need to question the success criteria for our design work. Are we facilitating growth at the expense of others? Why are we adding the features that we're adding? Who benefits from them and who loses? We can make sites more usable, less hostile to the people using them. We can make sites inclusive and accessible. But if all we're doing, and we're doing that with a bad business model behind it, all we're doing is leading more people into exploitation. As Sarah Walker Betcher says in her brilliant book, Technically Wrong, I believe that making interfaces easier to use is vital work. But when designers use clean aesthetics to cover over a complex reality, to take something human, nuanced and rife with potential for bias, and flatten it behind a seamless interface, they're not really making it easier for you. They're just hiding the flaws in their model and hoping you won't ask too many difficult questions. So it's hard to put a rating on this one. Maybe it's just a face with a zip mouth. Many of these patterns have become industry standards. We don't question their use like we should, because everybody else uses them, so why shouldn't I? And I speak at events like this because I know that you're the people who can help make change. I've been speaking on these issues for seven years, and while I've seen the awareness increase, the change is so slow. We've got to be comfortable being different. Be the person who creates alternatives. Be a better designer. Find ways to create and fund useful, fun experiences, cool technology for people without them having to lose the power and agency over their own data. Be the advisor. Do the research on inclusive and ethical technology. Make recommendations to other people. Make it harder for them to make excuses. Be the advocate. Marginalized folks shouldn't have to risk themselves to make change. Advocate for others and advocate for the underrepresented. Be the questioner. Question those norms. Ask a business, how do you make your money? Ask me later, how do I make my money? Why are we building these things in this way? Ask that question. Be the gatekeeper. When advocacy isn't enough and it's not getting you far, Use your expertise to prevent unethical design from happening on your watch. And be difficult. Be the person who's always known for bringing up that same issue again. Embrace that awkwardness. That awkwardness is power. Call out questionable behavior. Don't let anybody tell you that standing up for yourself or for others is unprofessional. Don't let people tell you to be quiet or that you'll get things done easier if you're nicer or if you smile more. Be the supporter. If you're not comfortable speaking up for yourself, at least be there for those who do. Remember that silence is complicity. Nothing is inevitable. Big tech will tell us this is the only way we can build technology. It isn't. Disrupt the disruptors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. That is the hot cup of coffee I think we all need <laughs> in, the, in the design audience. Wakes us up. So tell us, what is the biggest, design, biggest mistake designers make around accessibility? I think the biggest mistake we make is assuming that we know better than people for them, than they know for themselves. Mm. So if we're not disabled and we're making assumptions about how a disabled person might use something, yes. talk to them. Yep. Ask them. They will have far better ideas on how to improve technology than we will. Mm. Great. Uh, what are some of the simplest changes that we can make as designers to increase the accessibility or to decrease the inaccessibility, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it? Well, <laughs> I think probably the most important thing to do is to question with everything we build, how can this cause harm? Who are we excluding with this? Mm. But also just little things like changing the contrast on your site so it's not low contrast anymore. You saw that was 85% of sites. Easy fix. Mm. 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 Thank you so much for coming here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. But also receive some <laughs> gifts from Annelie. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> wow.